This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Anthony Gibson and Zach Lona. How are you guys doing? Doing excellent. Thanks for having us, Alex. Yeah, oh, man, thank you so much for, for coming on the show, man. I, You guys reached out to me and... Uh, I get reached out to on a daily basis to be on the show, and I get pitches constantly. But when I saw what you guys were doing, I was like, this is interesting. And, and of course, you hit a, a, a very sweet spot right now, uh, which is blockchain, NFTs, new alternative distribution models, using technology to empower the filmmaker. Because uh, there's been a slight history of filmmakers being taken advantage of by distribution. I'm not saying uh, many, but some. Uh, to say the you least, know, yeah. <laughs> just a, just a couple. I mean, it's it's not the norm or anything, um, but uh, but yeah, I wanted to bring you guys on the show to talk about um, your amazing new way of distributing through the blockchain, through NFTs. But before we even get to that, uh, how did both of you guys get into the business? So uh, we actually met each other uh, in Chicago. We were both based in Chicago at the time, um, and Anthony has since moved to uh, L.A. Uh, so we uh, met through our cinematographer, Zach Green, on a feature-length project, which uh, was uh, my directorial debut. It's called He Who Lives in Hidden Lakes, which is the subject of this project here. And then uh, Anthony and I have since worked on that very closely uh, with his, his production skills. Cool. And that's how you guys yeah. got together? And what made you get into the business, uh, Anthony? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, made me get into it. I just love movies. My grandpa used to chase me around his house wearing a uh, wolf mask and brought me into nice. the world via horror movies. What so. a great grandpa. That's an amazing yeah, grandpa. Yeah, yeah. He, he was big in horror, big in westerns. It's one of my first memories. We're like in his kitchen and he's chasing me around in that mask. And, what a, and it's interesting to have a first memory uh, of feeling like you're about to be eaten by a monster. Um, and I feel like that's informed the rest of my life, basically. Which I, made me uh, attract into his to Zach's movie here. So I think this this is uh, this is where the therapy begins, uh, Anthony. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so you guys you came up with this new idea called the patronized self distribution model using uh, NFTs, essentially. Uh, can you explain to the audience? And we've had other episodes about this, but I just want to kind of carry the baseline. What is an NFT in the simplest te- simplest terminology? <laughs> yeah, this is always a tough one, right? Because it's so yeah. new. And it's like, I don't know, I'll give, I'll, Anthony, I'll give my definition. And then sure. I've, I've thought a lot about, about how to position this. And essentially how I think of it is it's a immutable function on a blockchain that uh, represents a asset, like a work of art, a film, uh, a house alone, something like this, where uh, it's universally verifiable. Uh, so anyone, no matter who you are, where you are, uh, you can come into the blockchain code and you can verify that this token this nft represents uh this whatever it is so basically um uh that's more confusing than it was before so now um i'm actually more confused about what an nft is and i know what an nft is no i'm joking um so you you don't quit your day job no um basically to my understanding you guys can explain to this an nft essentially is a digital baseball card a digital comic book a digital painting uh as a one-off or multiple versions or a limited edition print of something so there's a 50 50 limited of 50 of this or only one of this and it's just a digital version of spider-man number one uh, but there's only maybe one of them, or there could be a hundred of them, or it could be a thousand of them, depending on how many you you okay. release out there. Is that a fair explanation of what an NFT is? Yeah, you know, I think like for me, the term in my mind is like digital physical or physical digital. It's mm-hmm. it's like a thing that exists like as itself that you can sell as a singular item, the same way that you would have any other merchandise. You can do that right. now with an NFT. It's a way to buy and sell memes, basically. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a way to facilitate digital ownership of something. Yeah. Right. And then when you were saying blockchain, um, I mean, I know what blockchain is. So, you know, the basics of blockchain, if you want to know about bla- the basics of blockchain and what NFTs are based on, uh, I have multiple episodes and I'll link that in the in the show notes on on blockchain explanations of it. 
uh, and what it all means in, in our world, because uh, that's a long conversation. And I think I've already had that conversation. So I just really want to focus on what you guys are doing. But I'll put that in the show notes, guys. So tell me then what is a patronized self-distribution model or a PSD uh, model? Yeah, so uh, patronized self-distribution is um, a way to not necessarily actually release your film, but it's a way to uh, verifiably own the film as a work of art. So um, a lot of uh, projects that have been uh, experimenting with NFTs in the film space uh, have been sort of in a in an addition or in a like a. Uh, you could, like you were saying earlier, you could buy multiple versions of it. Like you have like a limited DVD release or something like this. What uh, patronized self-distribution does is that it, um, uh, it it mints a scarce token of your film. So you, you're not uh, thinking of your film as a fungible asset anymore where everyone can go to uh, Netflix or Amazon Prime and see it. Now you're thinking of it as almost like a piece of fine art, like a unique one of one painting so then that is then mapped to the token um and then on top of that uh you can sell that token as a sort of uh non-fungible piece of art and then uh the economic aspect of it that we've designed that comes into it um grants the owner of that nft which is representing your film in all of its singular artistic glory and all the blood and sweat and tears you put into it, it also uh, gives utility uh, to the owner. So usually that's going to be mean like an economic benefit, uh, like a perk. Um, you can also have like crowdfunding type benefits with it with, uh, you know, maybe you can have dinner with the director and producer. But um, really what's what's uh, what what's going to make it the most powerful both for both you as a filmmaker and uh, your patron is uh, the uh, sort of an economic benefit to owning this token. Right. So when you're saying, uh, so basically someone, let's say I buy your movie for five grand, your NFT, uh, according to what I read in your, uh, on your, on your uh, website, uh, you, whoever buys that token would also get 50% of all streaming revenue uh, from here on to eternity, essentially in perpetuity. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then they would come in. So now, uh, I own it. Uh, I bought it for five thousand dollars, and then now after I've purchased it, it it releases the film because the film would not, had not been released at that point yet, right? Yes, exactly. So there are many ways. You, there, it, really, the sky is the limit with what you can do with NFTs, which is really like the power of it. It's like this is completely untapped potential, and there's use cases for this stuff that no one has even thought of yet. So this is a new one that we thought we would experiment with where we're saying, OK, we're going to mint our uh, feature film as a one of one token, which hasn't been done before, uh, to our knowledge. Um, and then we're also going to uh, give a, an economic benefit to, to owning the token. And that just exists in perpetuity. So the, the potential that that unlocks is you can trade the token again. It's right. again, we're thinking of the film as like a painting or a piece of fine art now where you can now there's now a secondary market for that for that film. And along with the uh, the economic benefit that which transfers on the resale of the token, uh, the new owner of the film token will uh, then receive that 50 percent cut. So yeah. we can get yes. into a little bit more, but it's 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 powerful. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's really like an exploration of incentive and figuring out like what we can do within this new um, technology to explore new models for small business. I mean, I think of myself as like a small business filmmaker. Right. And this is like like this new modality is allowing people to enter a space and be new and to define it and to set up new um, new norms, which is really exciting. And so I think like in this case, it's like, well, we had this feature film that we had produced and we wanted to see what we could do to distribute it ourselves. And there was like along came this conversation about NFTs and we just kind of racked our brains around like, well, what does the incentive look like and what could a uh, scenario be that would put something in the hands of the person who bought it, but also give us an opportunity to have an entirely new platform. And that's what's awesome about these aggregators is like you can self-distribute your movie, you know, and the terms that just happened to be attached to our NFT was, we're not going to touch the aggregator until it's purchased. And that was the term. Right. And and the the thing is, too, um, that, well, I, I'm assuming that the budget of the film 
was at a point where a five thousand dollar NFT made sense because if you spent a quarter of a million, half a million dollars on a movie, that doesn't make financial sense to give half of your streaming revenue away. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it depends. But let's say, for example, that I have a, a movie that has a, a star in it, uh, even a, not a not Brad Pitt or you know or Leonardo DiCaprio, but just a basic you know a, a star power that has a fan base. Uh, and then we put it up for for auction, as opposed to locking it in. Did you you guys locked it in at five thousand, right? Or uh, that was we the actually auction? didn't. Oh, yeah, we, was... we put it to auction. So we actually got a couple bids in, and uh, our starting auction was uh, one ether, which uh, I think at the time was like a little under two thousand. Yeah, bucks, was, like that. yeah. So we we got a couple bids in there, and it, it went up to two point two five ether, which was the strike price. So that was really cool to see the bids come in for this thing. That means that there's definitely like an inkling of a market forming around this stuff. But yeah. yeah anyway. So all right, so then, so if if I, we put the bid out and let's say that bid gets up to seventy five thousand, hundred thousand dollars, that's a very feasible thing, especially if you're guaranteed fifty percent of streaming revenue coming in, and that's a massive. It could be massive depending on the kind of revenue you're creating, where you're being put that on. Is that you know transactional? Is that AVOD? Is that SVOD? Is that PVOD? What what what? You know, and you can define all that in your NFT. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, with ours, and I'm sure everyone is listening to this thinking like, what are these guys doing giving up 50%? Like we haven't gotten into like why we, th we think that's a good deal, right? Uh, but yes, you can define any of that within uh, the economics of your token. It just so happens that we're including like, you know, AVOD, TVOD, every, anywhere it's streamed, uh, the, the owner of the NFT gets a 50% cut of our production company's gross. So not like the entire gross, so just what we take home. So the so then the question is, uh, why the hell did you do this, and how does this make any make any sort of financial sense whatsoever? <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's an exp like Anthony said, you know, it's, a, it's an experiment in incentives. Um, maybe do you want to take this one? Yeah. But I'm assuming it's an experiment because I experimented too. My first film was five grand. My second film was three grand. I experimented because my budgets were extremely low. I didn't experiment with fifty or hundred grand because I'm not rolling that deep just yet. So I'm assuming yeah. that the budget justifies this kind of of risk or this kind of experiment does that make sense totally yeah, yeah. i mean and zach can probably share more about where our, like the budget is coming from and all that stuff but for us yeah we were very much in a place where you know a like a, a one ether deal at a certain point um for the one-to-one -one nft was more interesting to us than maybe recouping um a any money like all of the funding back within the, the actual purchase of the nft but also to give away 50 percent of the streaming rights i think for us what's most interesting about it is the experimentation and saying look like we're trying something new we happen to have something that we're willing to take a risk with and it's like hey like if this means that more people would watch it like the idea of like giving up more money was okay because it's actually just about the piece of work itself and also what this could mean for the future because everything, every project you get at Alex is like a case study in like business and economics and all these kinds of things. And it's every project is going to have a new audience. And it's like someone who's buying soap and someone who's buying toothpaste, but they buy different kinds of things. You have to find another way to sell to that person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, the only way we're going to get to that knowledge is if we take the thing that we already have and put forth and say, we're putting our all, we're going all in on our chips here because something on the other side of this is going to tell us what to do next. Yeah, and, and to be specific about, uh, you know, why we're actually saying this is the utility that we're going to grant with this NFT is um, the uh, trying to capitalize on the incentive of either someone buying it out of the gate or on the secondary market of someone who uh, it, it's, it's almost like a like a high renaissance artist patron uh, relationship where um, the kind of person who has the money to uh allocate to this kind of, uh, you know, merchandise or artwork, um, they might have a, an, in, an influence in the greater world where we call it in the crypto space, uh, pumping their bags, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, okay, I just bought this NFT. I want to show it to everyone. So the more the meme gets out there that this is a movie and you should watch it, uh, the more valuable that the original NFT becomes. So the idea is the, the person who buys this, either one has an incentive to sell it to someone with a, with a large audience, essentially, or some influence, 
uh, or the person who acquires it outright can acquire it for a cheaper price, like say $5,000, which if we're talking about artwork, isn't really that much. Mm -hmm. Um, but then they can say, okay, I have an audience of, you know, maybe a million people and maybe I'm like a big YouTube streamer. I could drop $5,000 on, on this film, you know, shill it to my audience. And then within a couple months, I've made my initial investment back. And also now the, now that all of my audience has seen this film, more people love it, more people love it the more cultural gravitas that the film has. The more cultural gravitas that the film has, the more value that the original film NFT can capture on the secondary market. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like an uh, an incentive engine to keep things going and and, and, uh, pump the bag, essentially. That's it's, it's it's I know a lot of people feel, listen to this so like what are these two guys what are these three guys talking about this is <laughs> these guys are insane um, but look we're and I, I told you guys this before we started and I've said this a million times on the show before is that we're we're in the internet 1996 we're still trying to figure out what HTML is we're still trying to figure out what JPEG is we're still trying to get faster than dial up modems to log on to the internet without stealing an AOL disc from a magazine in a in a Barnes and Noble that's how old I am so um you know uh, that's where we are with NFTs with blockchain with um, all this we're at a very very basic beginning level and it's been around for i don't know since 2008 when bitcoin showed up and the concept of blockchain showed up mm-hmm. uh it we were we were around it's been around that long and it's taken that long to get to where we are now and people are starting to figure things out and again we I, i've talked about nfts at nauseam at some of these episodes so you can go deeper into that but i'm curious okay so obviously the budget made sense um the benefits make sense for the investor who buys this now, um, something that people might not understand is that if I buy your NFT, I resell it for twenty grand. You get ten percent of that for perpetuity. If that sells for twenty grand, and then uh, a year or two later it sells for forty grand, you just made another four thousand bucks, and and it keeps going and going and going and going. And hopefully, your next movie is you know Taxi Driver, you know circa two thousand twenty one, and then you blow up as a filmmaker. Well, the value of that NFT astronomically goes up. And I think you use the example of George Lucas. If George Lucas had Ethereum and NFT, what would the Star Wars NFT be? And I've said, what, is it, what would Taxi Driver be? What would be um, Amblin, you know, Spielberg's first short film as an NFT? What would that be worth today if it would have been treated as such and the technology existed when that came out? So is that right? Exactly. Yeah, we're so I come from a from more of a fine art background myself. I didn't start in, in film. I just sort of arrived at film as a consequence of feeling like that that was the best medium for my creative ideas to live. So I'm coming at it from I'm, I'm trying to uh, kind of combine these two worlds where now we have an opportunity because of this NFT technology to uh, assign cultural value that translates to economic value to like these priceless film cultural artifacts. I mean, film is such a big part of it you know, our culture. And, you know, you can argue that it's it's uh, sort of got a lot of competition this, these days, which it does, but that's an opportunity for uh, independent filmmaking at this level to sort of uh, um, ascend socially in terms of its social status. So I see feature films going more the way of uh, like the opera or, or the theater, where it's kind of more of a niche interest, but uh, it's got a very high, it's got a higher class uh, social implication to it, which uh, if we're then if then we're assigning fine art value to the films and that can be traded, um, yeah, the 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 value of of these tokens could you know seriously be worth a lot in the future. And also because of the technology, we get a creator royalty on each of those secondary transactions. So if you know one day this sells for a million dollars on the secondary market, we just pocket a hundred thousand dollars, you know, just automatically. Right, ex- exactly. And I mean, imagine Wizard of Oz or Citizen Kane or, you know, if you want to talk about fine art, you I mean, that's the equivalent, you know, or, you know, of, of the earlier Chaplin's first films or something like that as NFTs, um, treating film as fine art, which no one's really ever had that opportunity to because film is an ex- you know, film has always been something that you needed to sell a lot of tickets in order to make it financially viable. And that's the entire business model. This allows that to continue but yeah. this is just another revenue stream for it. like I, I i was telling people i'm like wait till marvel or disney jumps in on this 
Like yeah. what is what is what is the Avengers? What is what is the Avengers NFT worth? Yeah, I mean, I think, are, you know, it's interesting. Like the idea of like the the concept of reproducibility is dramatically changing right now. Like there's a seismic shift that is happening in understanding what like memes even are and like essentially what we're talking about is like a meme engine like a cultural like cultural currency being added to financial value of like singular internet objects and it's like the film has a one-to-one identity now the film is all films have always up until now had this concept of reproducibility films are not plays it, you know it, right. it, they're not a fine art piece this is that convergence of it's both now it's simultaneously both at the same time if you're approaching it with this model yeah and it's it's the same exact concept as you know the uh the, the nyan cat nft selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars like i don't get I, that like i don't understand yeah. that in the least but well it's, it's, not- it's the cultural gravitas of these memes that are being sold it, because it's coming from the people who are actually you know uh who created the meme uh off the bat so not only is it like uh, it's, it's the official sort of meme version. And then uh, the, the more that people share the memes, the more valuable that original NFT becomes. So it's the exact same concept. I mean, I know you, you guys are a bit young for this, uh, but uh, Garbage Pill Kids. Yeah. You know, if, I don't know if you knew what Garbage Pill Kids were, but I was a young guy when Garbage Pill Kids came out. And I remember the first series of Garbage It's a sticker, man. It's a sticker on a piece of cardboard. That was not Mickey Mantle, which was not Spider Man. It was a garbage, and they were selling for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Pokemon cards, baseball cards, comic books. These things have value to the audience that they're to the to the tribe that is in, invested in that. To to my wife, a number one first appearance in Amazing Fantasy number fifteen, first appearance of Spider Man is a bunch of paper. To me, it's like, oh my god, that's the first appearance of Spider Man. And there's a complete disconnect. Like she was like, "How much is that going to cost?" I'm like, "I don't know. Probably a million dollars." But you know, but to me, that's valuable. And so art is whatever value you put on it. Period. Yeah. Regardless if you agree yeah. with it or not. Yeah. yeah, it's funny to think too, like like that the interest economy of how like that's localized. Like you have a lo- like it's like a imagine a local economy where like value is interspersed amongst itself and has its own definition outside of something that exists over here and it's like things that exist on the blockchain with nfts like we have this dollar value that we can apply to it but it's like it's funny to think yeah like you can have one thing over in this corner and that can be worth so much to one person and then you come over here and it's worthless but it's validating those interests it's saying within those communities these things matter and they get to matter even more now i mean all you gotta do is go to comic-con and you can figure that out real quick (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I, I, I took my wife to my first Comic Con de- a decade ago, and she was just in like her mouth was on the floor. She's like, "I see these price tags on these on these little <laughs> books. What is what's going?" on? She's completely had no idea. She's like, "People are dressed up, like these are these are grown adults." And she would stop them and like, "What do you do for a living?" He's like, "I'm an attorney." What? Like, but that's but that is the world, and that's the value that that world puts on on those pieces of art, where you could walk into a a fine art museum or a gallery and i would i would look at something i'm like i don't know that doesn't doesn't float my boat but the person right next to me like i'll give you a hundred thousand dollars for that because it, he knows or she knows what that's valued in their community so this is just another at the beginning just barely starting aniba <laughs> level uh, of this this market for for films and i think independent filmmakers have the ability to really cash in and create not only revenue streams for themselves, but per, to provide some cultural um, cultural art for for the society at large, and like like Sundance, like Sundance winners, South by Southwest winners, Con winners, you know these these things that have these kind of labels. Like what would what would an NFT from the winner of Best Picture at Sundance be worth today? Because that that director could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars later on because of Oh, I got there for, imagine if you had Sex, Lies, and Videotape. The very first, 1989, basically the beginning of Sundance. This is when Sundance blew up at the moment that Steven Soderbergh sold uh, their movie uh, yeah. at Sundance for a million dollars or whatever it was back then. Imagine if there yeah. was a, if you had that NFT. What would that yeah. NFT be worth? In the, or Slacker or El Mariachi. Yeah. 
or, 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 or clerks. Imagine if you had, what would those be worth? And they would only be worth something to like my generation, your generation, people who understand what that is. The older generation would be like, I don't know, what is, what is that? <laughs> you know, exactly. it, it depends. Well, the, the fact that we're talking about these films in this context and we're realizing like, wow, how much would that be worth? I mean, it speaks to, I think, the viability of, of uh, this, this model that, that we've come up with here, too, because, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, why, why are these you know, pieces of paper worth so much? Not only is it from the, the meme and the, the uh, uh, cultural aspect of it, it's also the scarcity of it, too. Right. So, like, there's only so many, you know, holographic Charizards and there's only so yeah, many yeah. Uh, uh, Spider-Man first appearances like the, the uh, filmmakers uh, will do very well to understand these uh, principles around economics, uh, incentive and scarcity. So the, the decision to mint a single NFT was also driven by the scarcity question. So there's only ever going to be we're not going to mint, you know, an addition after this of, you know, maybe other he lives in Hidden Lakes uh, NFTs. The film is only ever going to be minted as a one of one NFT. So that means that that's just automatic built in scarcity. There's only ever going to be one. So that's that the dynamic of that makes it much, much different than if we said, OK, we're going to mint, you know, 50 of these or 100 or 1000. So what that does is, you know, there's much good work to be done in uh, designing incentives around those types of additions. But uh, what happens then is that you have to manage uh, each one potentially being worth less and also uh, in less demand as well. So it's it's you got to you got to look at your trade offs with uh, with this kind of stuff, too. Yeah, and I don't I don't know if you guys knew this, but I I jumped into the NFT market uh, when I did my first in, my first interview, and I put out I happened to be uh, the first film tutorials ever on YouTube. Yeah, uh, which makes me old as as dirt. Um, <laughs> but um, I happened to be I, I looked and I looked and I looked. I'm like I I think I'm the first guy ever to put and I, and I'm I I might be the first movie trailer. I can't. I can't say that for sure, <laughs> but I beat like Sony Classics, which was like four or five months after I released my movie trailer for my first short film in 2004. So I don't, I, and I can't find any movie trailers prior to that, but I, I don't want to say that because I'm like, that would be insane if I actually released the first movie trailer on YouTube. <laughs> but I, I, I yeah, don't know. I, 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 I can't say, I, can't, I don't have an NFT for it. But, uh, <laughs> but I did put NFTs out for the six um videos that i put out on that day tutorials mm. and i put the first three out just to see what would happen they sold out within two days there um yeah because i only sold them for 100 bucks but still it was just it was an experiment I was like hey let's see what's going on here so yeah. i put the rest of them out and and they've been slowly selling and it's just like wow that's because that's kind of cool like you have the first filmmaking tutorial now who is that important to filmmakers yep. or fans of mine you know like something along those lines you know, again, it's it's based on the perception of what that is valuable, what's valuable. Uh, there's YouTubers like, uh, you know, whatever, Cutie Pie, who's got whatever, 150 million followers, something like that. To his followers, he puts out a, a scribble on a piece of paper. There's value attached to that, which you and I would pretty much be like, let me put my drink on that. Uh, <laughs> but it's all about perception and value uh, and what people think the value is. It is a very, it, it's as... NFTs uh, and your model of NFTs as as ludicrous or genius as a piece of cardboard with a picture of a baseball player. Yeah. And yep. and someone attaching value to that. Yeah. It's it's just a piece of cardboard with a picture on it. But I because think ultimately yeah. the goal is to turn Zach into a human Pokemon card. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I, will, I will accept no less than ten million. Yeah, we're we're working on the holographic shirts right now. So. That's genius. Um, so, so what are some tips that you can put uh, give the audience uh, when they're creating uh, using the PSD model? What are certain things that should be in place um, for for a good successful PSD model uh, NFT? Yeah, I would say I would say uh, again scarcity. Um, it, and looking very closely at the kind of utility that you're including with uh, with the NFT, because you want to make sure that you're not giving away more than you're willing to lose, right? It's like you know the, that old rule of investing is you know don't don't invest more than than you can afford to lose. Um, so we we went about it and we said okay, 50% of our streaming revenue is an acceptable 
uh, trade off for getting this, you know, upfront fee, whatever it may be, because we tried to list it for 43 ether and then we uh, <laughs> put the starting bid at 12 ether. Now, I happen to think that it's still worth that much, like we were just talking about, but uh, because it's such a new thing, um, the market isn't willing to, to dip yeah. its toes that far into it yet. So mm -hmm. I would say, um, uh, Make sure that your that your the utility is not only uh, beneficial mutually for you and your patron, but also that um, your patron isn't uh, they don't have they try to minimize the work that they have to do in order to capitalize on it. And also, like I was like I said at the beginning, you know, uh, dinner and you know uh, uh, tickets to exclusive premieres and stuff, all that's cool. You can include that, but um, keep in mind that if you know you resell it, do you want to offer that to? The new owners of that, how often do you want to, you know, keep that going? Uh, it's stuff like that is is less quantifiably valuable to uh, an investor or our collector. And I also want to note that um, when I say investor in this context, much different from uh, your investor that's going to give you your budget to do the film. Mm -hmm. So it's an art um, invest. Because, it's an art investor. It's different. Yeah, yeah, it's it's much different. So you don't you don't owe them any money. Uh, unless you want to, like we're, we're owing our investor, our patron money. That's why I call it a patron and not, not an investor. But, um, there's also, uh, the, the, the next project we're going to be doing is, uh, kind of exploring how we can, uh, incorporate this model and do like a hybrid PSD crowdfunding model, because we, right. uh, we came into this already having the movie done. So it had never been released before. We had just finished it in, uh, you know, the the tail end months of 2020. Um, so we had already uh, had the budget and we, you know, did it and, you know, that's all done. So we were in a position where we could say, OK, we don't have to pay anyone back now because we were self-financed. Um, but now how do we use this stuff to, to viably crowdfund? Yeah. Well, how, what does it look like to explore uh, the nooks and crannies of, of incentive in development and how, you know, you know, Alex, you were talking earlier, like, you know, if you have a star attached, you know, that's that's often how distribution deals are made. You know, say, oh, I was able to attach X, Y, Z actor, uh, which, you know, these kinds of audiences like this actor. Here's here's a way of shoring up your investment because, you know, you've you've done the calculus and you're like, this will it, you know, the likelihood of this exporting value is higher because of this thing. And it's like, well, what does that look like? in today's age with so many different corners of value in the internet, because what does it look like when someone who um, does, um, you know, video tutorial podcasts or, uh, and also someone who does font fashion and makeup videos, someone else who um, does uh, video game streaming and you say, Hey, I'm going to put you all in the same movie. And what does that look like now when now you're tapping value from all of these different areas to say that yes. And all also, we're incorporating the, the NFT universe and instead of incentivizing with, um, you know, like various crowdfunding perks and saying you get a T-shirt and those kinds of things. No, you have an NFT. Like what if there was a way to create an NFT that could have value on the secondary market? And so it's all about finding all of those different areas of incentive. And for anyone that's looking to make projects, considering this as a model, you know, it's there. There are so many ways. It's ultimately so creative right now. You can do so many different things. And we're, right now we're just getting nitty gritty for our next project about what that could look like. Right. And you can I mean, in a crowdfunding say you could use, for example, someone uh, you could crowdfund uh, an NFT uh, and then just give them a percentage of based on what they give a percentage of the final gross or the final this or the final that some sort of. Uh, incentive in that way, so it's almost like more of an investment than a, a, a gift of of, uh, mm -hmm. of a crowdfunding. So it's now you're you're actually sourcing it out, and it's all could be done on the on the blockchain, uh, exactly. which would be ideal. And I hope one day we get to the place where all of distribution is done on the blockchain, um, and all payments yeah. are done on the blockchain, yeah. and everything's done with smart contracts and. And we don't have to deal with this BS anymore that, uh, you know, distributors do this or distributors do that or, um, excuse me, let me rephrase, predatory distributors do this, predatory <laughs> distributors do that. Uh, because not all distributors are bad um, by, by any stretch. There are a lot of great ones out there. Um, but uh, we focus on the, uh, the predators <laughs> on the show. Exactly. Well, I, let's let's talk a little bit about how um, distribution actually like functionally comes into this, right? Mm -hmm. So like for anyone who's still kind of like skeptical a little bit about it, uh, about this model we've done, I mean, we sold it. 
So we we made you know five thousand dollars off of this, which is comparable to a minimum guarantee you might get it from a distributor. <laughs> if, now, you're lucky, if, ever, you're lucky, if, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, exactly. If you're lucky, um, and not not well now you get the secondary uh, you know uh, revenue stream from secondary sales too. But um, you know think of it like that. You know it's like we can because uh, the other thing that's happening with this is that we are retaining all the rights to our film. We're not giving away any rights whatsoever with this because the revenue stream and the NFT itself are uh, reason enough, obviously, for someone to collect it. Um, so now uh, we could say, OK, now we're going to go to a distributor and collect a minimum guarantee from them. So that's, an, you know, an, another possible mm -hmm. avenue for. So, uh, yeah, essentially, like you were saying earlier, Alex, this is like another revenue stream for mm -hmm. the film that will also work to uh, hopefully automate some of the marketing lift that you have to do by virtue of it being this transferable uh, meme capture unit, so to speak. Right. And if you had a, let's say you did a thousand uh, units, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that out there, a thousand units, uh, and that those thousand units are worth the 10, 15% of, of your revenue jumping in. I'm just going off the top here. So you, you yeah. put away 15% of all revenue is going to go to these, this hundred units that you're going to sell on crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, excuse me. Uh, and then all of a sudden, all that, all those people who buy those hundred people, they're going to be incentivized to market the living hell out of this, yeah, and yep. get this out in the world. And if you did that with a thousand and broke up mm -hmm. that fifteen percent accordingly that way, yeah. uh, then you even have more. So it all depends on what you're doing, yeah. uh, and then you could also put a price tag on all of that just to get in the game. There's so many different routes yes. you can go on yes. this. It is, it is essentially the wild wild west right now. It is. It's the internet circa 96, man. It is like the uh, wild, yeah. wild west I think right you now. can take a look and see just like, like what's happening on the internet. How are people communicating on the internet? How are people pointing a camera at themselves? How are people, quote unquote, influencing? And then like how can – and then taking a look at that and being like, hmm, there is some serious untapped potential through this communication mechanism for getting new ideas – uh, getting new films out into the world and seen by people. And it's just about com connecting the dots. It's just saying, you come over here, you come over here, let's do this thing. It's, you know, it in some ways uses the same philosophy as like, you're, you're, if you're a YouTuber and you want to like go on someone else's show to get, to get some other audience to come see your thing and you cross pollinate. I mean, that's essentially it's taking that and it's scaling it up and using the blockchain in order to do that. And it's, it's all like Zach and I love to just like, you know, one of our favorite things about this whole thing is that it's just it's all memes, memes. Everything is a meme. And like that is like pretty like, you know, core to our philosophy in all of this. It's like, what can we do with memes? What can we do to make people think about memes? And, and that's <laughs> a, a cornerstone of the mythos that we're trying to create with a bigger world that we're actually working on. Now, you, all, you guys also created a physical version of the NFT to send to the person who purchased it. Um, which I think is awesome. How do you? How did you create it? Because it looked awesome from the pictures I saw. Uh, what was the cost, if you don't mind me asking? Like that, that was a customized situation. So, what was yeah. that situation done? How was it done? So it, that was a nightmare to put together. Uh, but <laughs> that, I'll just be front uh, up front and get this. So uh, our our collector wishes to uh, remain anonymous uh, for now. But uh, they told me like, hang on to it. I'll re redeem it when I feel like it. So I still have it like it hasn't left my house yet, uh, which I'm fine with because, you know, I appreciate that. Like it's 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 uh, gorgeous and we're pretty proud of it. No, it looks uh, stunning. I was like, that's gorgeous. Like that looks like a special, special, special freaking criterion, uh, you know, to the nth <laughs> degree kind of one on one. And I mean, it's beautiful. OK, you're making us blush. So. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's nice. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, very proud of it. But uh, in terms of the logistics, yeah, it was uh, so not many, uh, you know, packaging manufacturers take uh, one off orders. And the, the ones that do are, are pretty, uh, pretty pricey. And see, here's the thing, too, is that we didn't have to do that. Obviously, yeah. our patron doesn't even really want it right now, which is something it's a phenomenon that's happening in uh, the crypto art mm -hmm. collectible space with NFTs, where it's like, you know, there are artists who offer, you know, the physical painting with the NFT. Um, and collectors will say, I don't want any physicals. I just want the I just want the, the JPEG right. in my wallet. And that's totally cool. Um, so we went into it kind of uh, half expecting that. But for me, you know, like, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I come from a fine arts background. I like having like a, a physical artifact right. 
for uh, for the film that I've created. But you know, obviously that it. I'll put it this way: it was a lot of money, uh, <laughs> probably more than I would recommend uh, for for someone else who's trying to do this. But it is a very cool thing, and when it's in a museum, you know, in twenty, thirty, forty years, that's a nice little museum. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and when everyone yeah, understands my genius by then, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> hopefully I won't be Van Gogh are. when I'm dead, and they'll go, "Oh, Zach." Uh, <laughs> no, I get you. I get you. No, yeah. <laughs> no, um, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just saw. Uh, I saw a clip from. I don't even watch Doctor Who, but I saw a clip where they brought back Van Gogh and they brought him into the the museum. Oh, I've oh, seen that. Oh my yeah. god, that's so like you just start tearing up like an artist. Just like oh my god, it was so beautiful. Anyway, sorry, geeked out for a second, guys. Sorry, I apologize that. Um, so, um, so uh, did you? But I would. Am I wrong? Did you not create any other NFT things for like, you know, stills of the movie or other things or did you? You know, you're getting into sort of the next chapter uh, for us. Um, And, you know, we're working on a big part of I mean, I can let Zach take over sort of talking about like the content of the movie itself, because I think it's specific to like it's kind of amazing what what work ended up working out, what we ended up having in our lap at a time when crypto uh, was around, uh, kind of came to the mainstream. And our film is about a cryptid, like a, like a Bigfoot-esque Sasquatchian figure, cryptid. Cryptid meets crypto. And it was just like this perfect marriage of like, what can we do with that? And uh, I don't know, I feel like I'll let Zach kind of take over uh, from there. Yeah, I mean, there's so many places to go from that. You know, it's like, so... Uh, one of the ideas we have is, you know, uh, build. so essentially what we're trying to get at now, the phase that the project is in, is we are taking this feature film that we have and we're trying to use these community incentives to build an audience around uh, the IP itself. So, um, you know, we, 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 we can get into like the specifics of the plan, but we're, we're going to be minting more NFTs around the uh, the the fiction and the lore of this uh, of this you know essentially a monster movie mockumentary IP so you know like minting specific clips from you know the film like oh here's a found footage so the cryptid is called the hidden man it's mm-hmm. a proprietary monster that we came up with uh, you know here's a, a uh, an eight millimeter uh, still or a, a nice. film clip that we that we used yeah we actually used an eight millimeter camera for some of it it's uh, you know nice little badge of honor there. Uh, but um, yeah, like minting stuff like that and then uh, using that to sort of uh, do, uh, you know, add more value into the IP through those specific items of merchandise where it's like at a lower level. You know, you're never get you're, you're only one person can ever have the actual film NFT, but you can own pieces of the film. You can mm-hmm. own merchandise of the film that also give you like community benefit within the uh, the community that we're trying to build. So. so I'm going to pitch you guys something for an NFT. Uh, please bear with me. Um, this is a real yeah. thing. This is a real thing. This is I'm not making this up, uh, but there is such a thing called uh, Bigfoot erotica. Now, <laughs> wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. My friend told me about this, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is genius. Anyone listening right now, when you're done listening to this episode, type in Google Bigfoot erotica and just – just lose your mind at what you'll you'll find up. There's no, it's not just like pictures. It's like stories, like books, novels, ebooks about. It is amazing. I can't believe you guys haven't known about this. But oh. the best, but the best part was I had a friend of mine who's like, man, my brother's really giving me a hard time. I'm like, this is what you do. Go to his house, and he's married. He goes, go to his house and go on his computer and just start doing a lot of Google search for Bigfoot erotica and leave it on his, <laughs> leave it on his, on his thing and let his wife find it. <laughs> it's exactly what he, exactly what happened. And he left, he left. And then his wife, like his, his brother calls him like, dude, did you, were you, were you searching Bigfoot erotica on my computer? My wife thinks I'm doing it. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're sick and disgusting. And he hangs up. <laughs> wow. That so is that's savage. That is, that is savage, but that's, that's their relationship. I don't get involved. But yeah. NFTs uh, is a tool to ruin a marriage. Yeah, that's pretty uh, yeah, yeah. But No, but just, or, or, or just, or just, uh, you know, hidden man erotica. I'm just throwing it out there. Just throwing it out there. Well, 
hey, you idea. can add that to the and technically <laughs> the proprietary world of the IP. Why not? <laughs> Well, <laughs> Zach is speechless. If anyone listening, if anyone's listening, but I see Zach's face is just like in, in awe right now. He can't even speak. <laughs> like, yes, obviously, obviously, this is a thing that should happen. <laughs> no, it's funny. Actually, in the early days of the film, when I was exploring ideas, I was like, "What if we had a romantic encounter?" Tell so there you, you, there's yeah. a whole market that you guys are not serving, sir. There's a whole market you could be just selling this stuff to. I'm just, we're not saying there isn't a romantic encounter. We'll just there say. might be. There might be. There might be. <laughs> My well, God. Here, here's the thing. Let's get into uh, me and Anthony have, you know, we wanna, <laughs> we, we've got a very specific idea on how we can take this even further. So um, a new concept, a new blockchain concept that. Uh, people maybe are not as familiar with is uh, is a DAO, a D A O. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. It's a, a it's decentralized a, autonomous organization. Yeah. Oh, I've heard of uh, decentralized for banks, but not for organization. Okay, so talk yeah. to me about that. So there's been DeFi, which is yeah. decentralized finance. Yep, mm -hmm. and that's very cool. The next step after DeFi, after NFTs, is DAOs. Mm -hmm. So decentralized autonomous organizations, and these are essentially uh, corporate structures or business structures where uh, it's not really run by anyone. There's not really a corporate hierarchy, um, and the governance of the organization is equally spread out among uh, all of its members. So essentially, anyone can come in, buy the governance token, the uh, you know the currency that's native to the DAO organization, and start working on projects and getting paid for it. So um, we're still doing a lot of research on how to. It's a, it's, imagine it's a, a decentralized production company where every all the fans get to vote on what the next project is. That's what we're working on. And they're paying, and they and they pay for, and they'll pay for it by paying into. They can help finance it. It creates a yeah. liquidity pool, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, and they get rewarded for financing the production. And also, what's going to happen is we're going we're creating. Uh, now this is this is very early stages here, but we're really excited about it. The the core component of how this DAO is going to work is essentially it's going to manage the uh, Hidden Lakes IP. So um, uh, you know the 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 our, our film is just the first installment of this IP. We're going to be making sequels and stuff. And part of how we're going to get that done is that we're going to fractionalize and decentralize uh, licensing to the IP itself. So we're going to say, OK, we're going to mint a set of 10,000 tokens. You buy a token, you can send it back to the Ethereum contract. And uh, so it's you know not in our control. It's in you know the, the contract itself. And for as long as that's in the contract, as long as you're you know, in this bank, uh, you get in return a license to use uh, the, the IP however you want, except for hidden man pornography. Yeah, I mean the thing. The, the thing is, like erotica, sir. Erotica. There is a difference. Let's clarify that right now between Bigfoot porn and Bigfoot erotica. You can make erotica. You can't make porn. There you go. Correct. There is a difference. There is a difference, sir. <laughs> It's in, it's it's we're connoisseur. People are gonna think like that. I like like I'm enjoying Bigfoot erotica. <laughs> here, I'm the friend. one that started this Don't all right now. It's <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> That's so hilarious. I know right I now. I, I know somebody right now listening to this is like curving off the road, laughing at like the Bigfoot erotica <laughs> thing. Oh Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, this all sounds great. Look, this is the thing where we're so early on in this whole this whole experiment of NFTs and blockchain and everything. I've said this before on the show. I'll say it again. Blockchain is as or more important than the internet is to human civilization. And, yes. and people people who don't understand that statement, you will. Just the same way as people in 1996 said, the internet's going to change everything. Just like that guy who shot that rocket up into space the other day that looked like something that I won't say on. It looked like Bigfoot erotica. His rocket looked yeah. like Bigfoot erotica. Um, <laughs> that, that guy said, hey, I'm going to sell books on the internet, and now he sells everything. Uh, that That's the same thing that blockchain is going to do. We're just not there yet, and we will get there. Uh, and it's getting there. It's growing fast. And there's issues, and I think you said it in your article as well, uh, Zach, about uh, you know, Ethereum will become cheaper. It will become uh, greener 
there's still a lot of electricity that yeah. runs through to get all this stuff. So it's gonna it it's it's just like dial up, man. In ninety six, ninety five, ninety four, it's like dial up. It's like, uh, how can anyone can even think or conceive that I could buy something on the internet? Remember that I don't how old are you? You guys are younger than much younger than me. So I remember the time was like people were like, I'm not putting my credit card online. Like that was <laughs> people were like, I'm not putting my credit card online, that they're gonna steal my identity and all that. That was the mentality back then. That's where we are right now with blockchain. I think in five or ten years, blockchain will be at a completely different place. Crypto, I think, will be probably at a completely different place. Uh, and what you guys are talking about and DeFi and and DAO and all this these kind of concepts, I think, are are really going to help not only the world but in our little microcosm of independent film. Um, it's giving a lot of power back to us. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that like this, the, like the, the paradigm shift that's happening that mirrors the Internet uh, revolution, um, that's the, the, the main people who are going to benefit from it are independent creators. So what this technology does is it it cut outs the middleman. It cut outs the big centralized institutions that tell you yes or no. Um, it's really going to power the empower the individual creators who want to you know contribute things to their favorite stuff and make money in the process. Yeah. And you um and you so you give away fifty percent of all streaming rights, but as of right now, you still have to do the accounting. In other words, the money has to come into an account, and then you've yep. got to convert that into Ethereum or whatever you know uh, whatever uh, stable coin or whatever you're going to use to pay yeah. that person. Exactly. So that that goes to show how early we are. Where you know, in five years, that will all be able to do, be able to get done on chain. Right now, the, there's not really a solution for that. So um, we wait, to, you know, for however long that would take, and we'll just say, okay, we're just going to do the accounting ourselves. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, the, it it may be that um, not only is the smart contract upgradable, and that we can automate that, you know, from the token on chain. Um, or we could we could find a uh, crypto powered streaming platform, uh, which is also new territory, where uh, the film will be online and you can watch it for free, and also maybe even get paid for watching it. Um, and it also probably give us a better rate streaming wise than you know Amazon Prime or or Vimeo what, on demand does. You mean a penny a penny for an hour? Is that not fair? I think that's more <laughs> than fair. I don't understand. I mean, didn't you hear that that Jeff Bezos thanks us all for having him go up? into space um yeah built, built on the backs of independent filmmakers oh friends. don't even get me started <laughs> we made that rocket happen we made that it was all us we yeah. started off at 15 cents now he's down to one cent. what happened to those 14 cents boom into space bigfoot erotica <laughs> anyway uh <laughs> now i have to, so so another big player jumped on the scene in the nft world which is kevin smith and he came on with his film kilroy was here but he did the opposite of what you guys did. He's literally selling or giving his his distribution rights mm -hmm. away to this film. Um, what do you think of that, and how do you think that model is going to work? Did he even sell it yet? I don't even know if he sold it yet. Not sure. I don't think it's online. So we've been we. He, that was actually his announcement of that was actually the reason why we pressed the launch button on this project because we we've been building it since like March. Uh, we're like, oh no, we gotta we gotta beat it to the punch. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's online. But um, I, again, it's like it's it's very similar to what we're doing. But there's also some key differences that kind of make it. Uh, I, I I prefer to not take that approach um, simply because, like I was saying earlier, you don't want to make your patron work too much to exercise their uh, their uh, utility that you give them. So with uh, Kevin Smith's NFT, which uh, also is being minted on uh, the Phantasma chain, which is different from Ethereum, and we can maybe get into you know what chain you should actually mint on. Uh, but regardless of that, that's very technical knowledge. Um, Essentially, the, the the best person who's going to want to buy uh, the Kevin Smith NFT is a, a, a distributor. So, like, if uh, you come come at it from our perspective, where we're our target market for this NFT is a private individual collector, um, they're not going to know how to how the hell to distribute this thing, right? So, uh, if you're giving them the entirety of your distribution rights, that's cool. Just know that your market is much more different, and you're probably it's it's it like. If you're selling to a distributor and you're looking to give uh, the distributor your rights with the NFT, you probably don't even need an NFT. Like that's pretty much just the exact same thing as a deal okay. you would strike. In, yeah. in, in I, I think he's place. just. I think he's just trying to get some hype over it, and and that's all it was because sure. he's actually selling like you know Jane Silent Bob NFTs and he's making a mint with them. 
uh, you yeah. know, all those like cool little memes and stuff like that. He's he's not stupid in that sense. He definitely. I mean, he was one of the first podcasters. Oh, yeah. He was he jumped on the podcasting bandwagon years ago uh, before it was cool, uh, and uh, and everybody had a podcast. Uh, yeah. And pe- people tell me, I'm like, oh, you jumped in early. I'm like, dude, I jumped in six years ago. Like Kevin Smith jumped in like a decade or more ago. Like it's it was insane. Yeah. Yeah, um, respect the OGs. You sure. got yeah. yeah, Joe Rogan. Frick, man, he just yep. jumped in like oh nine. He like couldn't get the damn thing to stream. I saw the first, in the first podcast. He was just like trying to make it work, <laughs> and it was like like three twenty by you know by yeah. two forty <laughs> videos. Like it was horrible. Um, yeah. But uh, but he just made hundred million bucks, and that's not bad. Uh, he did okay. <laughs> it's good. Good ROI. Um, so I think, uh, I think like you know anyone that's doing anything in the NFT space is just like adding to the value of everyone else that's trying to work on it. Right absolutely. Now. And it's like we're all just trying to, like I said, like for us it's an experiment. Like we're curious about other people's case studies. We want to see what they're doing. We want to see like what models of incentive they're developing and kind of like, you know, work some magic. I mean, we're all really excited about the new technology. We need people to know about it. This is still super inaccessible to like an audience. Like they don't, most people don't understand this stuff. And so it's just like, we need more people to be interested. I mean, I had to, I had to educate. I took, it took me like half a day to figure out how to mint something. (laughs) Like the technology is so clunky. It's just so clunky to get stuff done now. I'm like, oh my God, isn't someone figured this out to make this a little easier? Like it doesn't seem that difficult, but it was like, and I use Mintable um, because it was the easiest. OpenSea was like too expensive. They wanted gas freeze up front. Mintable did gas freeze on the on the end. Now we're like talking in languages that nobody else understands. Um, yeah. But but yeah, but it was, it just, and even then Mintable was still like a pain in the butt to, to figure out. It just, it, it's just still so early, man. We're still so, so early. Um, now, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is we're talking about all these NFTs and independent film and all that stuff. Not every project is going to be a good candidate for an NFT. So no. what make, how, do you, how does a filmmaker know if their project makes sense for this world? You know, this is a, a, an awesome question. And I think Zach and I probably talk about this every day. And I think what makes particularly like understanding like internet communities like if if and who you're from a development perspective who are the people who are going to be investing in your project to actually like make it happen so you can go into production and those kinds of things who is your like financing audience essentially and like our our film specifically is targeted towards like like village voice myth making and where does that happen happens on the internet we're doing that every single day and so thematically, our project is designed to be talked about on the Internet. And it's like self-conscious of that. And we think that that in itself is interesting to people who, who are on the Internet creating and, and sharing memes and using that as a form of communication. And so specifically for this world that we're building out, which is like like m- like a modern mythos, basically, that's mm-hmm. using the Internet as, as like a, as like a community standpoint. People who are moving money on the Internet, people who are in crypto communities and want to see content that is more directly related to them and their user experience. Those are the people that we think right now, because it's the initial audience in this world that are going to be interested in funding projects and seeing things that reflect back like interesting elements to them. Yeah, I would say if, if you're trying to build a community like that and you're trying to build an audience into the IP and it's like the shared experience this is definitely NFTs are definitely the route for you. And I think, um, you know, to uh, for on a more logistical point, this is definitely geared to like like the PSD model itself. Um, it's assuming that you already have, uh, you know, you already have a completed film, first of all. Um, and that film is probably going to be low budget, like we were talking about er- uh, earlier. It's probably going to be uh, director driven um, to, you know, take the fine art sort of box um, and. Mm-hmm. You know, like we were talking about before, you know, maybe uh, if you have like a, a decent name talent, maybe you don't need, you know, the the boost that this PSD model would uh, attempt to give you. But at the same time, maybe uh, that's an incentive to grab an even more uh, a higher price at the auction. Right. So like, oh, uh, Brad Pitt is in this 
one of one NFT movie. I'm an art collector. I have a Jackson Pollock and and uh, Mark Rothko in my collection. Yeah. I can throw a million dollars at the new Brad Pitt movie NFT. That'll be fifty million dollars in in fifty years. So, oh. <laughs> what would what would a Kubrick be worth? What would be Prices. what would a, what would a Kurosawa would be worth? And now we have a no Nolan, Fincher, Spielberg, yep. Scorsese. You know what? What's the Godfather worth? Like it's just. It, I think once mainstream Hollywood and some of these directors start figuring these things out, they're going to go, oh, wait a minute. We, and, and we can make, not only can we make some money with this, but we can actually insert ourselves into the conversation culturally. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's worth that. And I think once filmmakers are able to, uh, these higher end filmmakers start doing things like that, I, I, you know, what would a Fincher NFT be worth, man? Yeah. What would Nolan? Fin what would Nolan? You know, what would Tenant be worth? You know. Yeah. Like and it, it, that line of thinking again is very different from saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're we're gonna have NFT tickets, where you know that might still be worth something. That's more like a like a collectible, you know, uh, Pokemon card or like a, right. a Beatles ticket from like yeah. you know 1969 or something like that. So it's it's like almost like two different asset classes. You have the scarce sort of fine art NFTs, and you also have the fungible. Uh, quote unquote, uh, like ticket merchandise, playing cards, yeah. merchandise NFTs. Yeah, collect so collectibles. Different. Yeah, exactly. Collectibles. Yep. So there are two different asset classes, and when we're thinking about what is a David Fincher worth, or is a Kurosawa worth, like that to me is the fine art. Uh, At least yeah, like no, Kuchar's no, art for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And obviously, Bigfoot erotica. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Pokemon card. <laughs> Pitch it to Game Freak, guys. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests, guys. Uh, what advice would you give filmmakers trying to break into the business today? You take that one, Anthony. Um, the advice I would give you is um, focus on what's in front of you and figure out how to... Um, like build a team around the things that you're stoked about and like, don't be afraid to just like not, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on this one actually. I'm terrible at giving advice. Um, what I'll say about this is that when I was in college, there were classes that were offered to me and I felt like that wasn't meeting the needs of what I wanted to get out of my education. So I figured out that I actually had the, the agency to create my own class and get credit for it and bring people on and make the movies that I wanted to make. And I didn't have to wait for anyone to tell to give me a curriculum to do that. Uh, so get creative. There's tons of opportunities out there. You don't have to just follow what's given to you. What yeah. is the I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, No, go ahead. That Anthony, per, Anthony, perfect answer for that. What is the lesson that took you guys the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Tax credit financing. <laughs> <laughs> touche, sir. Touche. Touche. That's a that is a very fine, fine, fine lesson to learn. Tax credit financing, everyone. Tax credit financing. <laughs> First time in almost five hundred episodes that someone said tax credit financing is Which the says something about how valuable it is. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh it's actually big on that. Yeah, and, they have an amazing tax credit. And three of your favorite films of all time. Ooh, uh, mine are weird. I like 2001. I sure. like Napoleon Dynamite. And the third one is a toss-up between Mystery Men and Badlands. Oh, that's a hell of a combination of films there right there. Man. That's, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put connecting dots. I'm like, I connected two and I connected two. Mystery Men. Wow, Mystery Men. First time on the show, Mystery Men. That's all. So I, I love, I love so Mystery Men. What a cast. What an insane I, cast. They had Cast, the production design, like the writing, it's Smash Mouth, Smash Mouth, Smash Mouth, Smash Mouth. Smash Mouth. Smash Mouth. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So that's that's mine. <laughs> how about how about you, Anthony? Um, I'll say uh, Princess Mononoke. Yes. Um, Little Miss Sunshine, classic indie, and I will say Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Probably, if I'm being honest. Here. Sure. Hey. Yeah. Nice. 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 It just captures nice. the the magic of childhood in my yes. life. Yes, and it's and it's a nice Christmas movie. It's like every yeah. time it's I always watched it during Christmas. That's when they came yeah. out. So I always associate Harry Potter movies with Christmas, um, right. as well. So uh, and where can people find out about your NFTs, about your films, about your projects, and so on? Yeah, so you can uh, learn about the film and the NFT at whoisthehiddenman.com. 
that's where all of our links are. And also follow Hidden Ones DAO, D-A-O, on Twitter. Uh, you can join our Discord, too, to get the drop on that cool DAO project that we're doing, which is the next step of this. Yeah. Oh, and also the, the film is live on Vim, uh, Vimeo On Demand, too. So mm-hmm. you can search for uh, He Lives in Hidden Lakes on Vimeo On Demand, and it'll be on uh, Prime Video as well soon. And you're, and you're using Film Hub as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are using Film Hub. Discovered them through uh, Indie Film Hustle, so thank you to that. Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 some good, they're doing some good work over there. Trying, trying. Everyone's trying. Everyone's trying to cut. Every, like I said, everyone's trying to break, you know, you know, break that nut. No one's can crack it. No one's cracked the nut yet on 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 the perfect model. I think it's always shifting and moving and and uh, but this is awesome, man. I thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Uh, I'm excited. Anytime I hear new ways that filmmakers make money with their films, and especially when it comes to the blockchain, I'm I'm all about it. So thank you guys so much for for coming on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having us, Alex. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>